everyone. I wanted to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we are the Champaign County History Museum. This is our evening lecture series. We hold a talk every single month on the third Thursday of the month at 7 p.m. We rotate between the Urbana Free Library and the, Cham and the Champaign Public Library. So if you would like to attend more of these events, well, you can expect one next month and one every month for the rest of the year. Otherwise, tonight's talk, we are proud to be able to partner with the uh, Champaign County African American Heritage Trail. Our two co-founders, Dr. Barbara Suggs Mason and Angela Rivers are here to speak. Um, but before we begin the talk, I'd like to introduce the two of them. An artist, educator, historian, and museum professional, Angela Rivers spent over 35 years in teaching, super, in teaching, supervisory, managerial, and consulting positions in museums and in the cultural arts area in Texas, Central Illinois, and the Chicago area. Her expertise includes the Disabled Museum of African American History, the Chicago History Museum, the Field Museum of Natural History, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Dallas Museum of Fine Art, and teaching African and African American art at Eastern Illinois University. She was an artist and project coordinator for the mural The Pictorial History of African Americans in Champaign County that formerly graced a building at Park and Fist Streets. A graduate of the Champaign school system, her family has been in Champaign County since after the Civil War. Her longtime interest is researching her extended family lineage within, his, within a historical framework, which dates back to mid-17th century Virginia, a perfect segue into co-chairing the Champaign County African American Heritage Trail. Working on the Champaign County African American Heritage Trail as co-chair has provided Dr. Barbara Suggs Mason with the opportunity to indulge in three of her great passions, the arts, history, and education. She grew up in Champaign, descending from family members who first moved to Champaign County after the Civil War. A graduate of Champaign Central High School, she attended Northwestern University to pursue her musical studies and also received her master's and doctorate degrees at the University of Illinois in music education, voice performance, and education policy, organization, and leadership. During her 37 years in public education in Illinois, Dr. Suggs Mason has received several awards for her work as a teacher and administrator. She is currently a consultant with educational organizations throughout the state. In 2017, Angela and Barbara consulted on and appeared in a documentary, A Home of Their Own, a documentary on the lack of housing for African Americans at the University of Illinois through the 1950s, one of many collaborations over the years, including this one. So without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Barbara Suggs Mason and Angela Rivers. Um, good evening, and I thank you for coming to um, our presentation, um, the story of the, um, 70, the 370th Infantry and Regiment in World War I and its impact in Champaign County. Um, the um, quote that you see here, family is like branches on a tree. We all grow in different directions, yet our roots remain as one. This particular topic is important to both Angela and I because it is a part of our family history. And um, we are first cousins. We are descendants of Carrie Ernest <coughs> Nelson and Cecil D. Nelson. And as we tell this story this evening, you will see how that is so meaningful for us and the roots of the 370th. The currently, as you see, is an image of soldiers um, from the 370th in France during World War I. Um, this is taken from fighting on both fronts, which is a story of the 370th, that um, WILL, um, the PBS channel <laughs> in Chicago, um, produced uh, approximately about three, four years ago. Oh, one of the things you'll see is that there is, is in their uniforms, um, these uniforms are, if you can notice, they're not American uniforms. Um, they are French <laughs> uniforms, and the hats are just kind of like little small hats and kind of gray, and um, it's their French as well. They did not fight with the American troops, they fought with the, the French troops. Um, the 370th Infantry Regiment was formed 
from the 8th Infantry of the Illinois National Guard, which was known as the Old Eighth. So the history of the Old Eighth um, goes, all, goes all the way back to just after the Civil War. Um, the returning troops, especially African American troops, as they returned to the Chicago area, they began to think about how, ways of beginning to protect themselves as forms of militias. By the 1870s, they had formulated a militia that was called the Command, and um, it changed names over and over, but finally, um, during the, um, the Spanish-American War, it was called up, the militia was called up, and it became the 8th Infantry um, of the National Guard. At that time period, um, they had um, nationalized all the local and state militias into the state militias to support the, uh, the American troops. Their headquarters, okay. um, their headquarters was located at 35, um, 33, 33 South Giles Street um, in Chicago, Illinois. That was right in the heart of what was known as Brownsville. Um, they recruited for the regiment from Springfield, Danville, Champaign, Urbana, um, and, um, Minneapolis, Metropolis. Metropolis, Metropolis, Peor, and Peoria. And um, also in the South, um, and um, well, that was Metropolis, that's right. It was a segregated fighting unit. As were all units. All units in the military, during, in the military. prior to Truman. Right. Um, it was, what was unique about it, it was an all black self contained unit, um, including officers, medical units, transportation, and supply departments. They had their own band as well as the enlisted, um, the enlisted personnel. Um, it was the establishment of these unions and their success had a major effect on the history of African Americans in this country. What was very unique about these is that they, they moved as a complete unit. Um, their first actions were seen um, in the Spanish-American War. The second actions were seen in the Mexican um, expedition of 1916, which was a pre preview of our capabilities as we went into World War I. And then, again, they were um, called into World War I. Um, when they were called up for World War I, that's when their um, name was changed, and it went from being the, the 8th Infantry to being the 37th. 370th. I'm sorry, the 370th, okay. Um, the 370th was part of the um, 93rd Division of the American Expedition Forces, um, and they were assigned um, first to the 40th Division and then the 10th Division of the French Army. And I think it's important to know that note that the reason <coughs> they fought with the French Army is because the American white troops refused to fight with them. There were two fighting units that were all black, the 369th, which are better known as the Harlem Hellfighters, and the 370th. Personally, 369th was just awarded a Congressional Medal mm -hmm. for their service, and if I have anything to do with it <laughs> and my bucket list, I want to see the 370th recognized because they have very similar records. Mm -hmm. They do. They have very similar records. And believe it or not, it was the 370th was the first to hit the fields um, at the front um, before the um, 369. So um, there was two other um, units also that were African American that fought also as well, but their entire contingent of officers were all white. So we don't necessarily see them as when you're talking about all black contingent. And they also did a lot of supplies, uh, that kind right. of thing. They were first supply. First, they were brought in as um, to work in supplies, and then um, the French was so heavily hit, you know, by the Germans and had lost so many individuals. They needed men. And they told the United States, well, we will take your African-Americans. We have our single knees, 
and we have our African troops that um, fight alongside our men. So we have no problems with it. And so that's how um, things have turned. Okay. Um, there was over three, uh, 300, 350,000 African American troops that served in the segregated units of um, both the um, 92nd and the 93rd divisions um, of the uh, American forces. Uh, most served as support troops. They're the ones who um, did the supply, the stevedores, built the roads, put down the um, train, train tracks, rebuilt the roads, built the bridges, rebuilt the bridges, and also they had grave duty, which meant that they had to go into um, the no man's land and um, get the bodies so and be able to tag them so they know who was who. Of those um, 45,000 actually saw fighting and the, and the troops that were, they were was of course the 369th that we talked about, um, the 370th, the 371st, and the 372nd. All of them was with the 93rd Division. Okay, when the um, 370th was called up, um, they were trained first at um, Camp Grant, which was outside Rockford, Illinois. They moved to Camp Logan near Houston, um, Houston, Texas. And what's interesting about um, their move to Houston, Texas, is just before they got there, um, some of their um, troops were assigned to go down and to get um, camp, the Camp Logan ready for them and some of the other troops that was coming. At that time, um, the, um, 20, the 24th Infantry, which was part of the Buffalo Soldiers, was also at the camp. They had been having a lot of problems with the um, policemen and the whites in the, in the town, and they ended up with a riot. And um, there was a lot of shootouts, and um, so they had to lock down Camp Logan. Um, so, um, my grandfather, our grandfather, okay, he was there um, pretty much during that time period. He had been assigned to go down and help set up the camps. And um, like he said, they, they weren't involved with the actual rioting, but the, um, the 24th was, and the, they were charged and tried, and 17 of them was hung. So this was kind of the, the feeling that was happening when they went down to Camp Logan to train to go into World War I. So um, the 370th sailed from, uh, for France on the USS President Grant on April the 7th, 1918, and arrived at Brest, France on April the 23rd, 1918. As we stated before, their training, their equipment, and uniforms were all part of the French army. And um, the French and the colonial uh, troops, African troops, called them partridges because of their proud bearing. And the Germans called them black devils because of their relentless fighting. Um, during the war and their time in the war, 370th suffered a 20% casualty rate, and 71 <laughs> soldiers received the French Croix de Guerre. Which is the equivalent of our Medal of Honor. These are listed men in Chicago waiting in line to enlist. Again, members of the 370th, um, the ones to the left um, are from um, when they were campaigning down in Mexico and along the border, and the ones to the right um, was in New York. You can see the... So now we come to our family history. William Frank Ernest was uh, born in Chucky, Tennessee, and at age eight his family moved to Homer, Illinois. At Homer, Illinois, he was a superb student. 
He was editor of the Homerin, uh, the yearbook. Um, he was an athlete um, and uh, one of the stars of their senior class. Um, he graduated from Homer High School in 1950, uh, 1915, and his family ended up moving. He was accepted into the University of Illinois as a student, and his family ended up moving to Champaign so that he would have a place to live. And so um, they moved to Champaign, where they joined Bethel AME Church. Um, he was a student athlete at the University of Illinois, a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity, which was the beta chapter, the second chapter established in the United States, the first being at Indiana University. And um, he majored in agriculture, and he enlisted for World War I in June of uh, 1917. Now, family story says that he and his brother, Robert, uh, Robert said, well, let's enlist. Mm -hmm. And um, so William Frank did. Robert didn't. <laughs> he eventually did serve, yeah. but, uh, but William Frank volunteered for the military. In fact, most of the fighting troops that, um, that fought, the African-American fighting troops that fought in World War I were volunteers. Um, they were comprised of the old militia groups, and um, they had volunteered to serve. Um, this is a letter uh, from uh, to his uh, sister, uh, Florence Ernest. Now, the Ernest family, um, Hester, for whom my mother is named after, and um, I forget. Oliver. Oliver, Oliver Ernest. Um, they um, had uh, four children, and uh, they also raised their granddaughter, Carrie Ernest, who would eventually become our grandmother. And so um, this is a letter that uh, William Frank uh, wrote to his uh, sister in which he describes, it's a fairly long letter, but we just took one piece out of it. The people are very prejudiced around here, but they don't bother me as I don't have much time to spend with them. Because really, his life in Homer um, in an integrated setting had been uh, much more accepting of who he was at the time. And um, when he joined the military, I think he got a, an eyeful of what it meant to live in a racist society at the time in the United States. And uh, Newport News was the staging area for them to go into Europe. And of course, you know, it's in Virginia, so it's you know, very much in the heart of segregation at that time period. He spent his time um, going to the Red Cross, playing games, you know, interacting with his friends, trying to keep a low profile all the time that they were there. I love this picture. Um, this is three of the four Ernest children of Oliver, Frank, and Hester C. Ernest around 1915. Mm -hmm. So um, at the bottom uh, on the right is Robert Ernest and um, he attended Tennessee A&I State Normal School for college, uh, which I believe today is Tennessee State University. Mm -hmm. um, and he fought with Company A. A of the 366th Infantry in France. And um, he would become one of the founders of the William F. Ernest American Legion Post 559. Uh, we called him Uncle Bob, and um, he lived a long life here in Champaign. You mentioned Eddie Glover. They lived, there were three houses, um, Bob Ernest, a uh, guy called Big Harry and his wife Allie, and next door, um, Eddie Glover. So they were, the three of them were right there in a row there. 
Yes. yes. It is in Champaign. Mm -hmm. So, um, William Frank Ernest was one of the first soldiers to die in France in from our battle. From and our county. From our county. But, but it, he was also one of the first in that, in the, um, his unit. One of the early years. Yeah. And so um, you'll see an excerpt from Captain Brandon. Now, he wrote a book after the war. He was the uh, pastor of Berean Baptist Church in Chicago, which still exists. I've actually been to services there. And he wrote about watching um, William Frank Ernest uh, die in battle. And um, you can see there, um, I don't, you, you can read that, but I, I do want to note, um, we lost 300 men killed and wounded, Sergeant Ernest of Company L being the first to make the supreme sacrifice on the Hindenburg Line, one of the most excellent exemplary soldiers I have known in my 20 and four years of service. The body, poor, bleeding, torn, and mutilated, was buried in the no man's land by his comrades. Why was he forgotten when the Distinguished Service Cross was awarded? Asked Colonel T.A. Roberts. He knows. And that is alluding to the fact that Colonel Roberts was a white um, officer who didn't have a lot of respect for um, the uh, black troops that were under his control. And they felt that uh, some of the men in the unit felt that um, Frank Ernest should have received the Distinguished Service Cross, which he did not receive. In fact, um, Roberts actually um, wrote a scathing report on the, um, the men that fought on that day. He said that they were cowardice, and he just went on and on and on, which of course which was a lie, and the French actually counteracted it. The French commander counteracted what Roberts had said about the troops. Um, on that day that um, he fell, um, our grandfather, which was Cecil D. Nelson, we'll talk a little bit more about him, um, he and a couple of his friends were the ones that they went out at night into no man's land. They crawled out and they buried him. The next day, it was um, explosions unburied him. So they crawled out again and they buried him before they had to move on. They became friends even though they both lived in the area. They didn't really know they each really other. They really didn't know each other. Yeah. But they met um, as soldiers in their unit and became uh, best friends. And so our grandfather refused to leave him there. Mm -hmm. He made sure every time they moved up, he would make sure that that body went with them. So, um, this is an, is an account in the Champaign Daily Gazette, November uh, 25th, yeah, uh, 1918. Mr. and Mrs. Frank Ernest Colored, 20, 221 South Water Street in Homer, Illinois, received a telegram Saturday from the adjunct general's office. Basically, the, it said that William Frank Ernest had made the supreme sacrifice and died in battle. He died on September 17th, um, 18, uh, 1918, only a few days before his birthday. And this is a picture of William Frank Ernest in his uniform. Um, this was published by his fraternity, Kappa Alpha Psi, um, and um, also another U of I student there on the left also died, uh, not in battle, but of illness um, while enlisted in the 370th.
So, uh, William Frank Ernest is buried in the American Cemetery near Frera en Tardenois. I actually yeah. took French, believe me. Um, <laughs> but in, in France, it's some place that I had hoped to go to visit, haven't made it there yet, but um, interestingly enough, um, my nephew did go visit this fall. At the same time, uh, Glenn Pence, who is part of the Champaign-Urbana History uh, Facebook page, had also noticed, which my nephew Nelson noticed, um, that his name was misspelled on his uh, tombstone. And through their efforts, they got it changed um, and corrected this year. So that was an interesting note. Um, I still hope to go one day. It became a, a, a goal of mine because I realized without his relationship to Cecil D. Nelson, we would not be here. And you will, will tell a little bit of that story. Well, one of the things that I had found while I was working on our family history is that um, William Frank also has um, a um, monument and a grave in Chucky, Tennessee, where he was born. And I was trying to figure out, he's in France. What is this here for? Well, my, his mother um, had that Hester. She had the, um, um, the tombstone marker put up in you know, their, um, the, the local uh, cemetery that, where the family was buried in. And um, one of the reasons why she did so is because um, after the war, they had, um, they put together um, these um, junkets for um, mothers whose sons died in the war would be able to go over to France and see their grave sites. Um, African American women were treated totally different than the whites. Um, the whites went you know, over on um, liners, you know, first class. African Americans either went third class. In one case, they went into, they were going to send them in a converted cattle ship to go over. My um, great grandmother, she decided she was not going to go. She wasn't going to um, put up with that, you know, just to say a last goodbye for her son. So she made him a brave here in the United States. Next is um, our grandfather, um, Cecil Dewey Nelson. Um, he is the son of um, Joseph Franklin and Stella Anderson Nelson. He was born in Urbana. He attended Urbana schools. Um, he was supply sergeant during the Mexican expedition of 1916. And there's, a good, there's an interesting story about that that was passed down the family as well. But I think it's something true about it because of where he enlisted. And that was that um, he would, had gone over to Danville and um, his uncle had, uncle-in-law had gotten him a job in the coal mines in Danville. And he was young at that time, it was about 14, 15, 14, 15. And so he worked in coal mines. He, his job was to lead the, the um, donkeys in. And of course, they put the coal on the barrels, and then the donkeys would um, bring them back out. Well, on the way out one day, they had a cave in. And he and his donkey just barely escaped. He was done with it. They said that he went um, directly over to the enlistment office and enlisted. <laughs> <laughs> then he became, um, um, yeah, and then he became a soldier. He was kind of a he was a a, a young boy who, who liked to explore. Mm -hmm. I heard one story. He tried to run away to the, with the circus one time. He was he was very adventurous, mm -hmm. and 
if you knew him even as an elderly man, he just always had a twinkle in his eye. Right, and he loved the outdoors. You know, he just loved to go out and just stay in the outdoors. He had upped his age in order to go to the Army. He lied about how old he was so he could get in. Um, during World War I, of course, being from um, Champaign-Urbana in this area, he was assigned to the 370th. Um, he met Frank Ernest, you know, through the 370th. Because like I said, even though they both lived in the county, they really didn't know each other. Um, Grandpa was like out kind of gallivanting and uh, <laughs> working in the uh, mines and working on farms and, you know, whereas um, Frank was very studious, you know, and he was in school. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. During World War I, he, um, Cecil was wounded during the action of Bois de Mortier, Mortier um, and received the Purple Heart. Um, later, he um, received the Distinguished Service Cross, the Silver Victory Button, and he was also a master marksman or sharpshooter as well. You see, he's wearing, well, the next slide, but he's wearing the French Quartier because yeah. he also received the French Quartier. Okay. You want to say it? Sure. Okay. On, um, October 18, 1918, he was awarded the French Croix de Guerre for bravery in battle by General Vincent Don, commander of the 59th French Division. And he was one of about three or four on that particular day, but it was a total of 71 in the infantry who did receive the yeah. French Croix de Guerre. In the infantry. Um, when, um, um, when he came back to Champaign County, he came back as one of the most decorated to come out of World War I from the county. There was a couple of other people that had quiet, but that is, you know, he's highly decorated and um, was, known as, was known as a hero. So this is the citation of which um, we do have the original copy in our family. Mm -hmm. um, it says, for extraordinary bravery, uh, sounded at his post. Notwithstanding his wounds, he continued to follow his company under violent artillery, artillery and machine gun fire and did not hesitate to crawl to an exposed and dangerous position in order to bring aid to severely wounded com um, comrade, a severely wounded comrade. He refused to be evacuated until ordered by his company commander. And that is a picture of the Croix de Guerre, which is currently being held by the eldest grandson of, uh, in our family. And um, very proud that he received that. I remember going to France, I was on the airplane, and I was talking to one of the gentlemen next to me who was French, and he said, oh, if you let the French know that your grandfather is a recipient of the Croix de Guerre, they will open up their hearts to you because mm -hmm. it was considered foreigners who, who received that, it was considered a very high standard of bravery. Another individual that was part of the 370th was Dr. Harry D. Um, Ellis. Um, Dr. Ellis was um, born in Springfield, Illinois. Um, he served as a musician, um, first class in the headquarters company of the 370th. Remember I said that they actually had their own band? Well, they did. Um, all the, Af all the African-American um, divisions had their own bands, and they would have competitions with each other. Um, they would also um, play for the locals wherever they were at. Um, I've heard um, stories of with the 370th, they'd be playing, and the next thing you know is that they have to go to the front, so they move, move directly from playing for the, individ for the people and parks and in parks and everything, and then go straight to the front. And then afterwards, they would come back 
take a break, maybe play for somebody else, if not just play for themselves. And the bands had a particular style that was yes. not the traditional style. Mm -hmm. And for many people, they felt that these bands, particularly uh, James wow. Europe, who was the band leader in the 369th, inter introduced jazz to Europe. Well, actually, it was all the black bands that they give it to, um, you know, <laughs> English because English stayed in Europe for a while and had his own Europe. band Europe, Europe for a while and had his own band. Um, so people are noted for him, but all of them, they were always in competition with themselves. And what we consider as um, ragtime and um, uh, early jazz, like what Satchmo played and everything, all of that had its beginnings in the background came from these military bands that came back from World War I. Okay, um, Dr. Um, Ellis um, attended the, when he returned, um, he attended the University of Illinois Medical College. Um, he was a member of the um, Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. Um, he also played um, banjo at the Ray Scott Band in the 1920s. The Ray Scott Band was an early jazz band that was here in Champaign that was noted, you know, for their style as well. Um, as he got older, um, he became president of the D Douglas Civic League and was very instrumental in raising the money for Douglas Center um, and helped to raise because when they, decided, when they built Douglas Center, the federal government, the Army, um, put in a certain amount, but the community had to raise a certain amount as well. And so he was one of the in, people who was instrumental in organizing those fundraisers so that they could raise the money to build the center. Um, his offices were located at 112 North Walnut here in Champaign. Um, and he was buried at Mount um, Hope Cemetery. The um, Ellis subdivision in Urbana was named after him. Dr. Lawrence DeFay was born in Bessemer, Alabama. He was a, um, a private in the medical division of the 370th Infantry and he attended the University of Illinois. Um, he became a podiatrist with offices on Market Street in Champaign, Illinois, and was a member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity, pictured here. And next to him is Taylor Thomas, who didn't serve in the 370th. He was a little, a little much bit younger, younger yeah. but um, you're familiar with him as the first African American teacher hired for Urbana and many other civic activities, also related to me on my father's side. Um, and he was a member of uh, uh, Dr. DeFay of Bethel AME Church, and he is also buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. Oops. Okay, Colonel Otis B. Duncan. Um, he was born um, of a prominent African-American family in Springfield, Illinois. Um, he was the highest ranking African-American officer to fight in World War I, serving as Lieutenant Colonel. Um, fighting with distinction, he and his men became the first Allied troops to enter Belgium. They pushed the Germans to Belgium, and they were the first ones to cross the line. Um, one of the six, he was one of 60 officers that was awarded the French Corps Guerre uh, for valor, and that's 60 officers um, wide with the, the American troops. Only 60 officers received the fr French Corps Guerre in the American troops, whereas you had 71 receive the French Corps de Guerre in the 370th alone. Okay, he is buried um, at Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield, Illinois. Um, Duncan, Duncan was very interesting because he was a professional soldier. Um, he, had, um, a he had started with um, the old eighth and he had gone through um, 
the um, Spanish American War, um, the um, Me Mexican Expedition, and then into World War um, World War One. After World War One, he continued to be the commander of the 370th um, through the 1920s. Um, they had, but um, after the war, they moved the headquarters of the 370th to Springfield, Illinois. Which of these individuals is he? Oh, sorry. Because there's three of them. Yeah, there's three of them. He's the center one. And of course, um, the um, American Legion Post 809 in Springfield was named after him. Um, additional local members of the 370th, um, there was more, but this was uh, some of the additional, I cho chose these for a specific reason, um, was Robert Barnes, who was Corporal, um, Samuel Bell, um, Sidney, um, Bridgewater, who's private, Sydney, was from Tuscola, Tuscola, Illinois. He was the uncle of the Bridgewaters, the older Bridgewaters, Pete and um, Cecil Bridgewater. Um, then there was also um, Raymond Hines. Raymond Hines was also a musician, and um, he developed. He also had his own band as well when he returned. And then there's Joe George Mott, who was a private. George Penny, who was a private. Okay, of those, Barnes, Bell, um, Mott, and Penny, their fathers fought in the Civil War. Um, the Pennies were actually living in Champaign County when the Civil War broke out. And they, um, so that they have a long history within the county. Then there was William Powell, William Powell is a very interesting man. Um, he um, received his um, degrees here at the University of Illinois. Um, he ended up becoming a pilot after the war. Um, he um, started his own aviation um, school in Chicago as well. Then there was Earl Simpson, who was a private, and William Strong. In World War II, were these young men essentially kids? They were young? No, these, they, they fought in World War I. I know, in World War I, but they were like your, your ancestors. They were in their early 20s. Yes, they, they were, were all. They were essentially kids. They were essentially right. kids. They were all in their late teens, early 20s. Yes. Yeah. So we've got about 15 minutes. Okay. We're, You're good. We're good? <laughs> okay. Um, by the war's end, the regiment, um, like I had said earlier, had pushed the Germans um, to um, the fortified city of Lyon that was in Belgium. Um, after, the, after armistice, um, they were stationed in France for a while, arriving at best on January 8th, 1919. Um, February the 2nd, um, they left on the SS La France and arrived in U.S. in, in New York, in the port of New York, in February 9th. Um, at the February 9th, they were um, rounded up, got their stuff together, put on a train, and sent to Chicago. Um, they arrived in Chicago on February the 17th. Um, when they stepped off the train, they arrived to a joyous crowd um, and they marched victoriously down Michigan Avenue to the old Coliseum where over 60,000 individuals jammed the, the arena. Um, after um, speeches that include the mayor, William Wild Bill Tom Thompson, and celebrations, they proceeded to um, Camp Grant where they were um, later discharged. But what's interesting is that um, Wild Bill Thompson was an about racist. He did not even think that African Americans should have even went to the war. And here he is after the war, buying to pr give praises to a unit that came from his city. They were the first, um, the 370th, they were one of the first of the um, fighters, the American fighters, to return home as a unit. 
They, were, they came very early. Majority of, the, major, majority of the fighters did not get back here until after, between April and June and into August. But for whatever reason, they put them on the, on the ship and brought them right back here. <laughs> now, one of the things that everybody keeps talking about is the, we always have to do this again, um, 369th. Um, 369th on the same date that the 370th had their victorious parade, the 369th had their victorious parade in New, New York. York. <laughs> they got all the, the paper, the publicity, <laughs> national publicity. But um, we arrived back first. <laughs> but we didn't, um, fight, we didn't get the publicity that um, the Harlem helped. Hence they get all of the, <laughs> they get all the, the hoopla. So uh, the Victory Monument at, uh, to the 370th is it currently, it's in Chicago at 39th and King Drive. And you can see it when you, if you're going around that uh, little highway into the loop past McCormick Place, you, if you turn to your right, you might be able to see it on King Drive, but don't get in a wreck. <laughs> no, don't get in a wreck. Or you can drive down King um, Drive um, on your way to McCormick Place and be able to um, see it. It's kind of in the area that's now known as Bronzeville. It's, yeah. Um, it was built in uh, 1926. The architect was John A. Nyden. Erected to honor the um, meritorious achievements of the 370th Infantry. And um, Frank Ernest's name is on there. Mm -hmm. um, the bronze panels and the soldier atop the monument were added in 1936, designed by Leonard Crunel, a former pupil of the noted Chicago sculptor. Lorenzo, uh, Lorado, I thought it was Lorenzo, Tad. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He's the uh, one that did the Lincoln statue. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are just some portions of it. Um, bronze tablet was added in 1936, and then they list the battles, uh, yeah. the site of the battles. Yeah, all the major were. battles that they were um, in. Okay, you want to tell the story? Okay, okay, A afterwards. Upon returning um, to Champaign, Cecil Nelson went to visit the Ernest family and um, to return some of the personal effects of um, Frank Ernest. Um, while he was there, he met um, Carrie Ernest, who was um, William Frank's niece. Now, when he first saw um, Carrie, he was kind of smitten, you know, because here's a woman, she's kind of like a young woman who's kind of cultured. And um, she was engaged at the time to another individual who was um, going to school to become a doctor. And he had actually given her um, a ring. But she saw um, Grandpa Cecil and in his full regalia, all his stuff, and she was just absolutely smitten. So he, um, there was being um, a dance that evening, and so he asked her if she was going to the dance, and of course she just had to go. But she didn't have any dancing shoes that fit, you know, because she was growing. And so she put on her shoes that she had gotten a couple of years ago that were too tight, so that she could be there, you know, and dance with him. Well, the dancing was very successful, even though she ended up with sore feet. Um, they were married that October. <laughs> and we are here. We are because they were. Yeah, okay. Right. It's a good they had six children, Cecil Jr., Ernest, Eleanor, Estelle, Hester, my mother, and Eunice, my mother. Um, the University of Illinois honored William Frank Ernest by placing his name on one of the columns of Memorial Stadium, completed in 1923 to honor student-athlete 
elites whose lives were lost during the war. And a marker will be placed in a strategic place at the Memorial Stadium um, sometime this year, um, dedicated to William Frank Ernest that tells his story through the Champaign County African American Heritage Tree. That's Carrie and Cecil. A little older than uh, when they met, <laughs> yeah. as we remember them. Right. Both of these was taken in the 1950s, so it's a little bit older. You know, There's more like we remember them. Then there's um, um, also after, part of afterwards, was the establishment of the William A. F. Ernest American Legion Post 559. Um, Amer African Americans from Champaign County, that, uh, this was dedicated to African Americans, that fought in Champaign County and died during World War I. Those who served did so with courage and honor and distinction. Many of those who returned home found community and service at the William F. Um, Ernest um, American Legion Post 559. Originally, it was located Fifth and Hill Streets. Um, the post now is located at 704 North Hickory in Champaign. Is that south of Bradley? Hmm? Is that south it's south of Bradley, Bradley yes. Mm -hmm. It's located at the tracks. You know, the, the cross tracks, oh, yeah. that's where it's located, the tracks, oh. just south of the tracks. Okay, okay it was founded in um, 1923. 32. Uh, did I say 23? Mm -hmm. I switched it. Okay. 1932 by um, African American um, World War I veterans. Um, of course, it was named after um, William F. Franklin. Um, the founding members of Post 559 were Clifford um, Cardell, Robert H. Ernest, who was the brother of William Frank, um, Dr. Um, Lawrence um, Dufay, Dr. Harry Ellis, Alvin G. Foxwell, um, Ray, um, Ray Hines or Raymond Hines, um, Thomas Macklin, Cecil D. Nelson, and George Ray. Though not all of them was part of the three, um, the three seventieth. You know, they had all either came to Champaign immediately afterwards, or was from here. And then our sources. Yes, and you there. I meant to bring a book um, that you can get online that talks about the history, and it was written right after the war. Um, of uh, colored soldiers um, that you can get online. And also the, what's the first one there? Complete History of Colored Soldiers yeah. in World War I. You can, you can also get, no, I'm sorry, Under uh, Fire. With okay, the, under you can get that online, the entire history. Um, the one thing I want to note is the story after the war of the men who came back to Champaign County is a much brighter, positive story. They faced Jim Crow, they faced racism, but the summer of 1919 was a bloody summer in the United States mm -hmm. because the soldiers who came back of black soldiers who came back from Europe and had fought came with a sense of pride. They felt that they had fought for their country and they wanted their rights. Mm -hmm. And it was a violent summer across the country. These men were slaughtered, killed, murdered, hung. Um, there were riots um, in Chicago. Um, the, uh, there was over 53 riots across the country during that summer. And riots, not the black soldiers rioting, rioting but no. the white citizens. citizens rioting against the soldiers. Yeah, and, and resenting that they were wearing their uniforms mm -hmm. and that they demanded respect because they had fought for the country. Yes. yes. Um, did they know when they signed up 
that they were going to go fight in the French army? Did they know that when they joined? No, they did not. When they signed up, especially the volunteer forces, when they signed up, they thought they were going to fight with the American troops. They thought that this was going to be one of the ways that they would be able to integrate the United States um, by fighting alongside the troops. Um, originally, they were, um, they had thought that, you know, they didn't want any of them to fight. You know, because one of the ideas is that they were just going to use all the African American soldiers to, you know, do all the grunt work and the behind the scenes. Um, but um, Pershing, um, General John Pershing, who's known Pershing. as Black yeah. Pershing, who's known as Black Jack Pershing, he had fought with them um, during um, the Mexican expedition, and he knew that they could fight and he said that he wanted them to fight. Um, but he was put, um, so he made sure they got overseas. And when they got overseas, again, there was this um, um, wall about them fighting with white troops. They were so afraid that they were going to um, riot um, in France, especially you know, um, in all the areas, the training areas. So they did not want those troops. They tried to give them to England. England didn't want them, you know, because they were afraid that they would um, rile up their, um, Colonies. their colonialists. And, but France was so desperate, and they were already using their colonial troops, you know, fighting next, door, next to their French, um, that they said that they would take, take them. So then, it wasn't over yet, because then, um, the um, folks who was the head of the expedition forces um, for the United States said, well, um, we're not going to um, use our money to supply these black folks um, with um, armory and suits and everything if they're not going to fight for us. So, of course, they were um, outfitted in French um, uniforms. But what they, what they experienced in fighting under the French was a level of respect that they had mm -hmm. not received in the United States. At all, yeah. And they came back with a level of self-esteem and um, much like the troops came back after World War II um, demanding that they have their full rights and they experienced, um, as I said before, a lot of violence against them as a result. Um, so, but the men that we talked there about in Champaign County became, in many ways, the leaders. Now, they may have worked as <coughs> custodians and, you know, um, handymen and that kind of thing, but they were the leaders in the black community. Yeah, they became. The they leaders. were small entrepreneurs. They were, um, they were leaders in their churches. They were leaders in their community groups, and um, they came back with a level of confidence. And they were people who of the uplift. They, their focus was to uplift the race, and that was very much a part of what was going on across the country. But particularly, we see that in Champaign County during that period. Yeah, their leadership um, provided the background for the training of the um, African American troops that fought during World War II. Yeah, a number of well. those men helped to establish the Servicemen's Center, which was at Lawhead School, which eventually became Douglas Center mm -hmm. and uh, Douglas Park. Um, they were because. The servicemen in, at Chinook who had no place to go. They weren't allowed to go to the servicemen's clubs. So they came to Champaign, and they had two rooms in the basement of Lawhead School where they could come for recreation and relaxation. And eventually, there was a, a, a groundswell from the community that they, the North End needed a place for recreation, not just for the soldiers, but for the community. For the community. Um, people like Powell that I had talked about, 
you know, Powell um, developed his um, aviation school up in Chicago. He trained a lot of the individuals that ended up being part of the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. So there's these people kind of like was the foundation in each step, you know, towards integration. So that's it, unless you have questions. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they got a lot of stuff. They got, yeah, when they you got read the history books of that's of all you hear about yeah, the 369. The so Illinois needs to come together <laughs> and let people know about the 370. Is there a movement to do that? Somebody like a I'm working on it. <laughs> no, not really. But what you, what you kind of have to do is get the support of our two senators, mm -hmm. local representatives, and it has to go through, from what I understand, a bill, and it's usually part of the military appropriations bill. They somehow put that in there, and um, and then the. Um, the entire unit would be awarded a congressional gold medal, much like the Tuskegee Airmen have mm -hmm. in the 360th. In 360th. Right, yeah. I think she, she, I, it, it is some, I think she might be interested. It's in. just always so much going on, mm -hmm. you know, you gotta kinda mm -hmm. get their attention. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is 30 years ago, the majority of people didn't even know about the 369th. Mm -hmm. um, it started with um, this guy who had found out about his grandfather had actually fought in World War I and he was connected to the 369th and he began to do the research himself. He started doing lectures on the 369th. People started catching on about the 369th and um, you know because he only did the 369th he wasn't aware you know of um, the other regiments that also fought. So, you know, they just kind of like fell off the, by the wayside and everybody's sudden 369 spreads praises. I think it's awesome that your family stories were carried. You know, I watched Finding Your Roots on mm -hmm. Tuesday nights and so many people and across the board, the family stories don't get told. And that's all lost, and they don't even know who their relatives are as a great grandparent. No idea yeah. where they lived or even anything else about them. Mm -hmm. I had a question about the Powell Aviation School. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, you mentioned that they trained the Airmen brother from the 99th Chief Squadron, which later became the Tuskegee Airmen. I was wondering if they were also in the full part in pushing to allow African American a aviators. Um, well, some of the people that was connected um, was Powell himself, you know, was kind of tried to um, petition the force. And there was other um, aviator, black aviator schools. Charles Johnson. Yeah, Tuskegee, Charles Johnson. Who was an instructor. Right. Then there was a, um, there was one out in California, I can't remember off the top of my head, the name of the aviator school. Um, and then there was African Americans that were becoming aviators, you know, immediately after the war. Um, our other, we had another uncle, his name was Leslie Nelson, and he was an aviator um, after the war, and he used to fly the mill routes to Alaska from Seattle, you know. Um, so there was quite a few that was um, involved with it, but um, because of segregation, they did think that uh, African Americans would have the capability to be able to fly they under that kind of stress. That yeah. they, would, they didn't have the ability. And they had, the Tuskegee Airmen had some of the finest, well-educated young men yeah. accepted into that. And Eleanor Roosevelt had a lot to do with that. She got in the plane in Tuskegee with Charles Johnson, who was mm -hmm. the instructor for 
uh, aviation at Tuskegee and flew with him, got a lot of publicity. I actually have it on my Facebook page this month. And um, that convinced her husband because there right. were people in the military in the upper echelon mm -hmm. who did not want that they to happen. They didn't want that to happen. And they tried their dangness <laughs> to keep them from being shipped overseas, you know. Yes, yeah, I agree. Yes, was. I just got through watching, um, actually watched a couple of films lately on FDR and her influence on him. And of course, I read Franklin and Eleanor, the, the book about their lives. And she definitely, and beyond the presidency, I mean, she went on to do work in the United mm -hmm. Nations and so forth. So. Are there any other questions for our two speakers tonight? There's none. Let's thank them one more time.